I'd like you to open your Bibles uh, to the single most well-known passage in the world, the one that 2.2 billion people can quote without even thinking. As soon as you start it, they say it, and all of you have it memorized, okay? You know where that is? Matthew 6, 9 to 13, okay? <laughs> You already know it, it's the Lord's Prayer. But, but I personally believe, the, the longer that I'm uh, spending looking at this, that the Lord's Prayer, which is in the very center of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five, he ends it at the end of chapter seven, right dead center, in the middle is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer summarizes everything that Christ taught in his ministry. Remember last week I showed you the seven elements of discipleship? Every one of those elements we find woven into this prayer, and Jesus said this is the manner, not the words, uh, it's wonderful we all know those words, but we're supposed to go so far beyond just knowing the rote repetition of the sequence of seven phrases into what it means. Because if we understand what it is that Christ invites us to do, first, this morning, being connected to God by focusing on who he is, but not just on who he is and you fill in the blank. Jesus said, focus on God as father, and not just as father, because you might have many different concepts of father. Maybe you had a good or a bad one or none, you know, and you just have, have just made it on your own through life. But don't just focus on God as father, but as your father in heaven. See, every part of this prayer is, is very powerful. So this morning, how to connect with God by the way, connecting to God through prayer is one of the disciplines that Jesus taught. It's one of the elements that everybody needs to be discipled in. In fact, prayer is so powerful, and yet there are people that, that, that feel reticent to practice it. Uh, they, they, they have a hesitation. And, and the Lord says that prayer is supposed to be so much a part of our everyday life that we're supposed to be praying without ceasing. So this is the only concept Jesus taught that is supposed to blanket every part of our life. So how do we connect to God? We connect by focusing, and, and that's the element this morning. We're going to focus on who he is as our father. So this morning, what I'd like you to do is understand how the prayer starts. And I want you to think with me what this father concept means. Jesus Look at 6, 9, Matthew 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. Note the context of this prayer in chapter 6. It starts in chapter 5 with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching, 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 teaching, and he pauses in the middle of a three-chapter-long sermon, and he pauses in the middle of it and says, the father I've been teaching you about, and by the way, you know what's so interesting? Uh, here, I'll outline for you the Sermon on the Mount, and you can all remember it after this time. Here is the Lord's Prayer right in the center where Jesus says, our Father who art in heaven, okay? But he starts in chapter five, verse 16, saying, Father, then he goes, Father, Father, Fa by the way, this is the first time he's ever called God in public his father. And seven times he describes God as father. Seven successive revelations of the attributes and character and nature of God as father. And after he gets all done with those seven, he says, you know the father I've been talking to you about for half of this sermon? That's who you're supposed to pray to. And after the prayer, in verse 13, he picks up in chapter 6, verse 14, and says, that's the Father who forgives, and he keeps going, and he describes God seven more times. So if you want to summarize the Sermon on the Mount, you can do it this way. Father, 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 Father. Father, 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 Father. That's the outline of the Sermon on the Mount. 
that everything about the character of God, the more that we understand of who it is we're talking to, the more that we can, without ceasing, live our lives with his blessing, with his power, with his comfort, with his arms around us. Every positive thing you could think about a father and amplified exponentially is what Jesus reveals. And he said, that's who I'm asking you to pray to. And that's who I want you to understand what it is he wants to do. So prayer is talking to God, but not just talking to him as God, but as God our Father. And then prayer starts by a focus in our hearts. Who is it that I'm talking to? Who is it? I, I remember once my, I was in Tulsa and I was working away in my office and my cell phone rang and I pulled, now that was a long time ago, back when cell phones were, you know, very unique and special and, and uh, in the early 90s. And I pulled my cell phone out, hit it and started talking. And someone said to me, hey, I'm praying for you today. I just want you to know that. I said, who is this? And he said, you don't recognize? And then two words in, I was just turning red. And I said, how did you get my phone number? He said, well, I pray for you so I know how to get your phone number. And I said, thank you, John. It was John MacArthur. He called me to see if I was studying my Bible that day and how I was doing in the ministry. And when I realized who I was talking to, it changed everything. Did you know that Jesus said everything in your life will change and, and will be transformed to the degree you understand who you're talking to, who he is. And so that's what we're gonna look at this morning. And after that pause to, to tell them to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus focuses on God seven more times. And so what we need to do this morning is learning what it means that God is our Father. And, and we learn that through the attributes. Actually, what Jesus does is he gives us a whole series of attributes. And, and I'm gonna go through each one of these, but for those of you that, you know, I don't have much time to, to get your, you know, focus, you, I'll just give it all to you now. He is the one who rules the universe. He is all powerful. This is how Jesus describes him. He is perfect. Be perfect like your father in heaven. He rewards those. He sees everything. He doesn't just see it. He says he is in the secret place with you and he knows what you need before you even ask for it. So that's, that's the, the teaching Jesus gives, which, which issues into the introduction of God through his attributes. See, what Jesus doesn't give is, a, he doesn't tear a page out of theology book, he writes the theology book. He says, the one who rules the universe is sovereign. The one who is all powerful is the omnipotent one. The one who is perfect is the only perfect being, the only perfect anything in the universe. Did you know only God is self-sufficient? We are not. We have to sleep. Most people go unconscious for several hours. They're totally helpless. They could be murdered, carted away, tied up, anything. We're, we're unconsciously, defenselessly helpless. And we can't exist without that. Try and go, you know, one of the forms of torture is sleep deprivation that they use to, to torture people and extract information out of them in, in, in interrogation. We are not self-sufficient. We have to breathe. You can hold your breath three, four, five minutes, four minutes, uh, you're starting to get in trouble. Go without water, not for very long. Go without food, mm, you know, for a period of time. We're not self-sufficient. God is, he's perfect. He doesn't need any external supply of anything. And he never exhausts everything he does, his creative acts don't reduce anything. He is self-sufficient, all-powerful God, perfect. Everything else is imperfect, everything. The greatest anything in the universe is wearing out, winding down, burning up, gonna suffer a heat death sooner or later, except God. And God is self-sufficient. He rewards because he is love. He is omniscient. That means that 
that everything is equally vivid before God. Before creation, after the earth is burned and reconstituted, and everything that's happened for all the history of humanity, everything is equally vividly in front of God right now. He sees everything equally vividly. Every moment, even the ones that we have not seen go by, he sees them vividly. That's omniscience. He doesn't discover things. He doesn't count things. He doesn't calculate things. He doesn't add to his knowledge. He doesn't learn anything. He knows the sum of all that is and all that is possible. It's amazing to think about his attributes. Omnipresent means that God in his totality, his entire being is everywhere equally present in the universe at all times. Now he's not part of the universe, he is not panentheism, he's not in this pulpit, and he's not pantheism, which means the pulpit isn't God, but he is completely present right here in every other spot everywhere. He's equally present. Now he doesn't operate equally in the same way every place but he's equally present everywhere. And that's what his omnipresence means. He's everywhere present. When he says you go in your secret place, whatever it is, some people it's the secret place in their mind or the secret place they lock all the doors or whatever. He says, I'm there too. You can't get away from me. And he says, I know your needs, I'm gracious. So this, this God is the one we're supposed to talk about when we focus on our Father in heaven, we're coming before him in prayer saying, I'm coming before you, O ruler of the universe, who is all powerful. You are perfect and self-sufficient, and I certainly am not. I'm not even gonna make it through this day. And, and you promise rewards, and I, I, I'm not sure I've got any right now, and you see everything, so you know why I'm coming to you right now. I'm not trying to get your attention. You're already aware of this, right? Aren't you? And you're actually here so you know what I'm going through. And you, you know what I need before I even tell you. But you want me to tell you. See, all of that is what Jesus introduces. This, what I just read to you is the run-up to the Lord's Prayer. And then Jesus says, look at chapter 6, verse 9. After teaching them all those truths, he says, in this manner, verse 9, therefore, pray. I want you to address your prayers to the one I just described to you. He's our Father. Our. See, this, this is parallel. This connection starts at salvation. It starts with being born into his family, John 1, 12, to as many as receive him. They have the rights of sons and daughters of God. We, we start by the new birth, and Jesus, through the work of salvation, opens a passageway, a connection to that God, the true, awesome, ever-living, self-sufficient, ever-present, all-knowing, with all power and no diminishing or exhaustion or depletion, God. He said, that's what I would like you to get used to talking to. So I thought what would be good would be as we sharpen our focus on God to begin our time listening and responding to this prayer by doing this. Let's all bow our heads quietly. Okay, everyone, we're gonna sit with quietly bowed heads, and I want you to repeat the words we're gonna focus on this morning. And the, the only thing I want you to do is, as you say these words with your eyes closed, I want you to open your heart, as open as you can make it, to the one that you're addressing these words to, and just say, I want you, I want you to focus me this morning and just who you are when I talk to you, okay? So with heads bowed, let's offer this model prayer to him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wow. That's the pattern. That's the model. That's not the prayer that's supposed to be repeated. It's nice to do it. But that's just the beginning. That's the recipe. That's the framework. That is what Jesus said. I want you to actually build your entire earthly life without ceasing praying like this to the one who rules the universe, who's all powerful, who's perfect. But let's, let's just go through the elements because we need to learn what it means that God is our Father. Start with me in verse 16. Because Jesus is describing the Father to us, he's introducing the Father, but he starts by introducing him as the Father who sits in heaven. The Father in heaven. It's not just Father, it's Father in heaven. And look what it says in verse 16 of chapter five of Matthew. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which father? Your father in heaven. Now, now for us, we might just think, oh, I can just imagine God, you know, this kind of Colonel Sanders kind of, you know, white beard, you know, big jolly smiling. Is that, I mean, what, what am I supposed to think of when I think of my father in heaven? Well, keep going because people had that problem in the first century too. Look at verse 34. But I, because people used to take lightly talking about heaven. In fact, they'd say, I swear by heaven that I'll bring that shipment of product to you. And you know, they were just, they were abusing the term heaven. So look what Jesus says in verse 34 of chapter five. But I say to you, do not swear at all. You don't need to do any of that run up. Just say yes and no, you know, be honest. But, but don't swear by heaven. What does heaven mean to you, Christ Jesus? for it is God's throne. Now think about what it means when we say our Father, the one that's in heaven, he's the one who sits on the throne. See, Jesus ties God the Father to the one, look at this, who rules the universe as the sovereign overall. Now, I was toying with uh, showing you something, our tax dollars at work in America, you know. By the way, they just exceeded uh, in, in uh, one of the quarters was the highest intake of federal income of taxes ever. I think it was something like uh, $900 billion, all of us paid in taxes in one quarter. That's a staggering amount of money, you know, more than a lot of countries combined in the world. But part of our money that all of us give in various ways was used for the Hubble telescope. And NASA this week showed us our tax dollars at work. And it was phenomenal. It was so good. I've watched it over and over again. What it was is the Hubble telescope, you know what that is, named after Edwin Hubble, the, you know, the red factor, Hubble constant, all that stuff that he did. He and astronomers with him were peering out and they developed this telescope that is the most magnificent photography tool to see distant objects. And they took 411, our government did, pictures of the Andromeda galaxy, our closest galactic neighbor. And they took those 411 shots and combined them into one picture. And it's, it's something like 63,000 pixels by 90 some thousand pixels. I mean, we're talking about a big screen here, you know, it, it bigger than flat screen TVs at Costco, you know. But what is really neat is they made a movie of it. And what it is, if you watch NASA's movie, you see you're on a mountain and you see a city below and all of a sudden you see the, the stars and the Milky Way and all of a sudden you can just see the faint glow of the Andromeda galaxy and then it goes and gets you close to you see Andromeda, kind of the pretty picture. Then it cuts a little corner of one of the wings of the galaxy and it zooms you in to see the individual stars. There are 100 million of them in that little mm. And the, for three minutes, you have countless dots with all this magellic cloud and stuff around it, and you're just going by 
all those stars. I mean, it's just countless. It's like looking at, at, at sand. It's amazing. And then it pulls back a little bit and shows you the corner you were looking at. And then it pulls back a little bit and shows you the galaxy. And then it goes whoop. And it becomes tiny. And then it says at the bottom, that's a small galaxy. And there are more galaxies in the universe than there are stars in that galaxy. But that's what one looks like. And then it says, thank you for spending your tax dollars with us. You know, isn't that neat? And you know, people probably thought, well, we're great, you know, and everything. But you know what I thought? Then sings my soul, my savior God to thee. What? How great thou art. How great is the one who rules the universe that sits on the throne. Well, it says in Isaiah that he calls every star by name and not one of them fails because he's holding them. That means that not only are there like all those hundred million that I looked at three times this week, just blurring my vision, you know, and just thinking about each one of them as a solar thermonuclear explosive device radiating energy in every direction. Not only are there all those, but they're all named. And not one of them fails to continue thermonuclear fusion because God knows him by name and is holding them together. That's what Colossians 1.17 says, that the ruler of the universe, by him all things consist. He is before all things, but by him all things consist. He is ruling. Sovereign means there's no question. It's like nobody challenges him. Did you know that that's how we know that the Bible was written by God? Because when Satan rebelled in Isaiah 14, what did he say? He's shaking his fist and he says, I'm gonna be greater than God. Are you kidding? He knows. He's the most powerful being ever built. But he said, I just wanna be like God. I know nothing can be greater than God. See, Satan, the most powerful and brilliant creature, says nothing can be greater than God. I just wanna be equal. I don't wanna be greater. Nothing can be greater. Well, keep going. Look at verse 45. Our Father on the throne of heaven not only rules the universe and is sovereign, he is all powerful. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now that's talking about a facet of God's character, his beneficence, his kindness, his goodness, his, his uh, you know, equanimity or whatever you want to call it, that he, he allows it to rain on bad people and good people. It's not like you can tell who's being good and bad in your neighborhood by the ones that no rain falls on their garden, you know. It's, he just rains on everybody. So, you know, that's nice. But he's the one that causes the rain. Now, look back what it says. He makes his, his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain. God makes and he calls the sun his. He named it. It's his. It would stop shining like it did on the cross. Remember? There was, there was not an eclipse. Eclipses do not last three hours. Come on. We all went to school. God just stopped the sun from shining on the earth while his son was on the cross and bearing the ignominious weight of the sin of mankind. He says, I'm the one that makes the sun rise. Now we know that the sun doesn't rise, but what's harder than making the sun rise is making the earth turn and rotate. And it's not self-sufficient. The earth does not rotate on its own. It doesn't get up in the morning and say, I'm gonna rotate, I'm gonna rotate, I'm gonna rotate. God set it in motion and sustains it. That's what all powerful means, omnipotent. And he's the one that, that set in motion the hydrological cycle and the meteorological cycle, and he makes it rain. Look at verse 48. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, this one is astounding. Uh, our perfect is our perfection is being in his likeness and being like him and, and becoming like him and partaking of his divine, uh, you know, powerful, as Peter says, we're partakers of the divine uh, God himself. We partake of him. But what are we partaking of? 
we're partaking of the only self-sufficient being or entity in the universe. Everything else is not self-sufficient. Everything else is winding down. Everything else needs feeding and power and, and everything else. And, and then he says in chapter six, look at chapter six, verse one, your father who sees in secret will reward you. He's the one who rewards because he is, he is love. But, but as you go on to verse four, it, it's a very interesting play of words. What Jesus, by the way, he hasn't even started the prayer. He's just introducing God. Look what it says in six, four. He says that your charitable deeds may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. You know, there was a big um, civil rights, personal rights, you know, our rights as citizens uh, case coming up because now there's new police radar that police cruisers, the ones that are rich enough to afford this equipment, can actually see through walls and houses. I mean, this is old military stuff. Now they're we're getting all the military stuff in the police, and they can actually see people, how many people are in a house. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's old hat. They've used that in the battlefield for decades. But now we're getting it portable. And so people are, oh man, that's uh, taking away my rights, you know, and you're intruding on me. But look what the Lord says in verse uh, uh, four. Your father who sees in secret, and he doesn't need a police cruiser with a, radiation admitter, he sees everything of everyone all the time equally vividly. Everyone is in front of his face. What does it say in Genesis 6, 5? And every imagination of the thoughts of all humanity's heart was only evil continually. God was processing and watching and registering every thought, imagination, deed, and everything of every human on earth. And he still is. And he says, hey, I am the God who sees everything. That means I'm omniscient. What's neat about omniscience is that it isn't like God discovered, oh, well, look at that. What the, oh, I didn't know that. When did that start? Everything is equally vivid before God. That's what omniscience is, and it's staggering to think about. But keep going, it gets better. Look at verse six. Jesus says, but you, when you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, Look at the wording. This is so amazing. Pray to your father who is in the secret place. Now, you know, you could say, well, the secret place is in heaven. Actually, the emphasis of this word is that when you shut the door and went into your private hideaway spot, God was already there. You can't get away from him, is what he's saying. He is everywhere present. That's what omnipresent means. That means that God is completely, all of God is everywhere at all times in the universe. Psalm 139, whither shall I go from thy presence? Whither shall I flee thy spirit? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other most parts of the sea, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell and Hades in the grave, even there, you are with me and your right hand will uphold me. God is everywhere present. Now look at verse eight. Could be kind of scary. Be kind of like a horror movie that you can't get away from him. He's everywhere watching and there. But look what verse eight says. It says, therefore, don't be like them, the heathen. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. You know, this, this idea of knowing uh, is experiencing. It's, it's, a, it's not just a factual. He feels do you know what the most frequent emotion of Jesus Christ was on earth? Sympathy. This, this compassion, this, this moving, it was a visceral, it's a visceral word. It means Jesus was moved with compassion. He, he felt for people and their needs. That's, that's who we're talking to. This father in heaven feels our needs. So, so Jesus said this, so, so think about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has tooted along through half the sermon. 
He says, I'd like you to know the one who sits on the throne, it's a sovereign. He is all powerful, omnipotent, perfectly self-sustaining. He rewards those and he, that he loves. He sees everything and not just at the moment, but everything that's ever been. And by the way, you can't get away from him. He's right in front of you and you're right in front of him. He's omnipresent. And he is feeling your needs because one of his attributes is his, his goodness and kindness, his graciousness and mercy. He feels. So now look at verse nine. What does Jesus say? He says, therefore, in this manner, pray. This is how you're supposed to communicate with God. Our Father, the one who's in heaven, ruling the universe, who is all powerful, who is self-sufficient, who loves me so much and has seen everything in my life before I even knew he was watching, not only seen from afar on his monitor, but he actually stands by me. I'm before his face, M prosthen. I am in front of his face all the time. And he is, is tracking through life with me, feeling my needs. By the way, what needs does he feel? He knows, it, he equally vividly sees our entire life. Not just our tempest in our teapot of the moment. He feels it all. You know, that's something very interesting to think about. For the sinner, God feels all their sin all the time. For us, we live like this. That's past, this is coming, this is now, that's coming, that's... We live in the succession of moments. God equally vividly sees all sinners of all time and all their sin. It's evil continually before him. Unbelievable to think about what God tolerates coming up before him. Well, he says, pray to me, and that's what we're supposed to do, but, but look, he is the one Think about what this says. What verse nine says is, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I am opening the door. He's only been describing God the Father in those seven attributes. But in verse nine, he says, that's the one that through salvation becomes our Father. He's not just mine anymore. He's yours too. If you're born into this family, if you receive salvation, he becomes our father. And he is the one who art in heaven. That's, that's euphemism for he's the one sitting on the throne of heaven. So our father, the one sitting on the throne in heaven, and he's the one, Jesus said, that hears, that, that we address. Have you ever thought about the mechanism of prayer? Jesus opened the pathway. He made the, uh, by a new living way, through the, the sacrifice of his body for our sin. The Holy Spirit transports the prayers and God the Father receives them. Isn't that amazing? What is that saying? He's listening. You know, I learned a great lesson in marriage from my, in fact, I learned a lot of lessons in marriage from my wonderful wife, but one of the lessons that I learned from my wonderful wife was not very many weeks or months after we were married, I came in and I says, and da 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 and da 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 and she, she listened, she said, you haven't told me that before. I said, oh, I've been talking about it for weeks. She said, no, you've been thinking about it for weeks, honey. You've never mentioned that. She said, I, th I think it's a wonderful idea, but you've never said that out loud to me in all the months we've been married. And I said, I haven't. She says, no, you think more than you say. And I said, oh, and that was the first big lesson that I had to learn to communicate, uh, not only to, to listen to her, but also to communicate what I was thinking. Do you know what's so neat about the Lord? He listens to our words, the ones that we say in our prayers, but he inhabits our thoughts. He also understands our feelings. See, this is what is so neat about, in fact, it even says that our groanings, I mean, we're talking about uh, the Lord listens to everything. And he says, I hear you. I listen. So Jesus said, let me introduce you to this person. Talk to him. He's listening. And then Jesus goes on to re 
emphasize seven more times, and let's go through those. He says, so I just told you you can talk to him. Let me explain to you once more who it is we're talking to. And, and look at this list, uh, starting in verse 14. Um, our Father on the throne next, in verse 14, forgives sins. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. What did Jesus say on the cross when he was hanging there? Father, forgive them. Who is the forgiver? The Father. Jesus said, the one that you're talking to in prayer forgives sins. Uh, how does he do that? Because he is just and the justifier of those who come to him through the sacrifice of the one and only way, his son, Jesus Christ. God is a justifier. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, Romans 3, 24 onward, which is in Christ Jesus. God justifies because his character is, he is just. He is a God of justice. You know, when, when people bother us and hurt us and offend us and wrong us, we all, it's all right, forget it, you know. I was just in a restaurant and I saw, you know, uh, a waiter drop something on someone and they just went, you know, they, were, they were just horrified that they did it. It was a nice place. And they went, oh, we're so, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do it. And the person said, forget it. That waiter won't forget that. And that person won't forget it because it got on them. But that's just a common, eh, you know, eh, forget it. That means I can't get even with you right now is what it means, forget it, you know. But God says, he doesn't say, forget it. He says, I can't forget anything. Everything is equally vividly before me all the time. Every debt has to be paid. So I've made the only way for you to be forgiven is through the justifying work, the substitutionary work, the imputed righteousness of Christ's work is the way that in my justice, Christ dying in your place on the cross and you putting the hands of faith upon him and identifying with his one and only sacrifice in your place, in my place, is the only way sins can be forgiven. So Jesus says, as you pray to him and you realize how sinful we all are, he forgives sins because he is a justifier. But look at next in verse 15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, because we're supposed to do that, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those, we just said it, who trespass against us. We are supposed to be as quick to forgive them as we are quick to want the forgiveness from our justifying Lord. And it's supposed to be a constant uh, process. But he says, if you don't do that, if you do not, verse 15 of chapter six, forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Our father in heaven, the one on the throne, disciplines his children. He's holy. He says, if, if you have received my forgiveness of your sins and you withhold your minuscule, tiny forgiveness of the person that hurt you. When I've forgiven you of everything, and you won't, for see that's Matthew 18. That's the servant who the king forgave him a lifetime of lifetimes of debt, and he wouldn't forgive someone of a week's pay. You know, they owed him 500 bucks the boss forgave him 10 billion, and he threw the buddy in jail for 500 bucks. And what does the king do? He's enraged, Matthew 18 says, and sends that wicked servant to the tormentors. God says, if you're my child, and you don't behave like my child, forgiving as you were forgiven, then you will not enjoy the benefits of forgiveness. Have you ever met a bitter person? Boy, they're, they're sad to be around. All they talk about is how everybody hurt them. And, uh, yeah, oh, oh, they hurt, oh, and they hurt, and they just, they're embittered. They live, they, they're kind of like brine soaked. You know how all this, you know, you brine your chicken, you know. These people are brined with 
with their bitterness. They're blind by bitterness. And they just, and they don't feel saved. They don't act saved. They, a lot of them are sick and a lot of them are anxious and they just can't tell and they just blame it on everybody else. It's because they are not tenderhearted forgiving as God in Christ Jesus forgave them. And that's part of the Lord's prayer. The Lord says, hey, make sure that you realize your sins are forgiven and make sure that God will discipline you if you don't forgive everybody around you. Keep going to verse 18. So that you do not appear as men to be fasting. Now he's going into fasting. But your father who sees in a secret place, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He watches everything. God's watching everything. Nothing escapes. He's watching how we do things, why we do things, where we do things, when we do things. He's watching it all. And, and what's so neat is he's just reminding us of his omnipresence. And then look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for neither they sow nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Whoa. Jesus, Jesus, who always told the truth, said, God causes the birds to continue to be sustained and live. You know, we, we like this idea that God, or our scientific community, that not God, but something exploded and started this whole thing going and it's all going on its own. They don't want any interference. Jesus said, the next time you see a bird, think of my father in heaven. He's making sure that bird finds something to survive. When it's out there rustling in the parking lot, I'm making sure that it's finding something to eat. He is the sustainer. He sustains everything. Uh, then keep going down to verse 32. I love this. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you have need of those things. Our Father in heaven understands our needs. What does that mean? He's caring. He knows our needs. Uh, he isn't just watching a monitor and saying, oh, we got elevated levels here. It's, he cares. He's there. I mean, he doesn't just see it. He's standing with us. He feels. That's what Hebrews 2 says. Jesus feels. He has compassion for us because he feels what we're going through. He cares. And then, look at chapter 7, verse 11. We saw this last week. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven, the one on the throne, give good things to those who ask him? And in the parallel passage in, Matthew, or in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, he says, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit? So he is the supplier, and primarily for us, the greatest supply we need is the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God is the one that, that fills, empowers, energizes, and causes to operate all the system our giftedness and calling and, and the way that God designed us only works when we're connected to the Holy Spirit, when kind of like a hydraulic system, only when he fills our lines does everything work the way it's supposed to work. And without that hydraulic pressure, it just and, and we need to be filled, energized. And then finally, this one is fascinating. Look at 721. Our Father in heaven controls the gate of heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, goes through the motion, says all the right words, you know, fits in, knows the lingo, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the one sitting on the throne? No, only the one who does the will of my Father. He's the king of the kingdom of heaven. And he's the one that controls the gate of heaven. The one sitting on the throne is the one that allows people in because he's the savior. In fact, that's how Titus introduces. Paul calls God our savior. God is a savior. We always think of Christ as our savior, but Jesus Christ is the exact representation of God. He reveals God to us. If Jesus is savior, he's only revealing that God is a savior. So Jesus said, I want to explain my father to you. He's the one that will forgive you of your sins because he's just and a justifier. He'll discipline, though, because he's holy. He doesn't overlook anything. He watches everything. He's on the present. He sustains everything, even feeding those birds. He knows everything you need. He's caring. He gives the spirit of God, supplies everything, and he controls the gate of heaven because he's the savior. So what do God's attributes mean? Now, let me just pick one because it's almost time to go. Um, if, if I, 
I, I'm just going to talk about this. Uh, I'll just do this one, okay? Jesus describes the sovereign omnipotence of God in Matthew, let's go there, 10, 29. I think it's 29. That's the problem of being away from your Bible too far. But I'm only sure it's 29. But let's 10, yes. Now, now think about what Jesus says here. And every time you see a bird, I hope you remember what, what I'm gonna tell you right now. Are not two sparrows, two common birds, sold for a copper coin? Matthew 10, 29. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. So think of a cloud of birds. And think about, Jesus says he knows every time a sparrow falls. Now, the first, usually with Greek words, there's a primary and then there are secondary usages and uh, meaning of it, nuances. Primarily, that means whenever they fall to the ground like they died. You know, they, they wore out or the wind twisted them too much and they cracked or something or they hit the windshield. I mean, whatever it was, or hit a power line or something. But they, they fall. That does not happen. Look what it says. Not one of them hits the ground apart from your father's sovereign, omnipotent involvement his will. But you know what's interesting? Wider usage of that word became not just for birds, you know, dying. It's also used in wider literature for, have you ever watched birds, how they hop along the ground? I mean, they, they don't walk, they boop, boop, boop. And that's the word that's used for every time a sparrow hops flits between you know a puddle and a dumpster and up to the wire telephone wire and then back down and over there and have you ever seen those birds that fly in synchronized clouds and they just they look like they're all on some kind of plan like that what he's saying is they don't do anything apart from god in his sovereignty controlling this universe so Next time you see one of those clouds of birds swirling, settling on a patch of grass and all hopping around, remember that God is aware of every hop of every bird and then look up and say, wow, if the birds that exist for a couple of seasons have each hop tracked by God, how much more does he care for you, Jesus said, of little faith? You see, we're supposed to know who we're talking to and when, when we realize all this, we approach God in prayer saying, I know that you're kind, you're characterized by goodness. I know that you're perfect and self-sufficient. I know that you're watching everything and when I respond to you, you're rewarding. And I know that you know everything I need and you're hearing even my groans and you've already forgiven me of all my sins and you care about me. Now, where are we gonna go next week? And it's gonna be very interesting. We're gonna have a little box and we're just going to surround the box with what does God's uh, omnipotence mean? What does God's omniscience mean? Uh, what does God's, uh, his goodness and kindness, uh, which is displayed in his wisdom, which means God knows the best way everything should be done that will be the most beneficial for everybody involved, mostly him. And, and we're gonna take all of these elements and, and uh, uh, let's see. Omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. And then after we define the elements of them, we can put one thing at a time with it, like job. Can God create a job for you quicker than the, whoop, quicker than the Democratic Congress, he can create a job for you. Can God, does God know how he designed you and can he make you a perfect fit? Does he know the best way to accomplish your job? Uh, is he with you in the interview? That's who you're talking to. It changes the way we pray when we focus on the one we're connecting to, when we realize 
who our Father is. Let's all stand, and we're gonna close with a word of prayer, and what would be more fitting than to speak to him now the way he told us to, to talk to our Father in heaven. But before we do that, at the end of the service and every service here at Calvary, there'll be godly men and women standing here at the front with the word of God. And you have listened to all this and you say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm fully connected to all that. I mean, I'm not, I don't fully think all that you're talking about is operating with me. We have connection specialists. That's really what they are. They are experts in showing from the word of God how to do a diagnostic of your connection to God. And, and maybe you feel disconnected from everything and you just need someone to share a burden with. So we're not supposed to go through life crushed. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. You need to bear a burden. They will listen and pray and talk to you. And, and that's at the end of the service. But they're only representatives of our Father. And that's who we'll talk to now. So let's bow before him and pray once more to our Father in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And God bless you as you go.